I understand there'll be a swabbing of that. What about fingerprints? Uh, fingerprints, they will do. And we understand that Donald Trump will will plead not guilty today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's he's he says he's not going to make a speech in the courtroom or speech uh, outside, but uh, just not guilty is what he is expected to say. Short and sweet, but obviously he's unpredictable. So we are we'll see. we are going to dig into not only the historical significance of today, but also the legal implications and perhaps the new Trump legal strategy, what it may be, even as he is scrambling to put together a legal team at this moment. But for now, let's bring in Meg Oliver, because she is out the, outside the courthouse with us, too, where all the Trump supporters have gathered. Meg? Yeah, Nora, it is quite a spectacle out here on the ground in front of the courthouse. As you can see, several hundred Trump supporters have turned out. They're waving flags. They're chanting USA and go Trump. And as you can see, there's also a lot of media, probably more media than Trump supporters. There are also protesters. I talked to one woman who traveled all the way in from New York City. There are people with signs saying lock him up. And the crowds are continuing to build. We have been watching cars streaming in here. None of the the roads are blocked off, Nora. And as you can see, there are just more cars. They're beeping. People are taking pictures outside. And as also you can see, an increased security presence on the ground, by bike. And there are several police cars that are blockading around the federal courthouse. However, multiple federal sources have told CBS News they are concerned about the security situation. If this crowd continues to grow, and we know there are four more chartered buses on the way from Orlando with another 200 people expected to join this crowd, they are very concerned of keeping this crowd in control. There's only yellow tape bordering and protecting some portions of this building. So we will continue to see how many people show up here. But, Nora, it has been peaceful all day long. Meg Oliver with the protesters outside the courthouse here. And, John, we have been pouring through this indictment um, since Friday when it came down and the, and the former president was informed he was at his Bedminster estate uh, in New Jersey, got the word at about 7 o'clock uh, that he had been indicted. It has been a weekend of going through this and a lot of analysis about what the president is accused of. Jack Smith is the special counsel. Harvard trained lawyer, triathlete, um, all by all accounts, a pretty determined guy. And by all legal experts who've read this, said it's a pretty tough document. Even the former attorney general, Bill Barr, saying it's very, very detailed. What does Donald Trump face? He faces a couple of big problems. One is that it's detailed not only in the specifics of the, of the claims that it makes, but the sources for those claims. It includes a transcript of his own voice, the president, former president's own voice, saying things that undermine one of his defenses, which is that he declassified everything. But they have a transcript of him saying, this hasn't been declassified. It also has texts from employees within Mar-a-Lago talking about the movement of documents. Why does that matter? Because the assertion in the indictment is that the president orchestrated. This was not done by some lawyer, not done by some clerk. This was the president moving the boxes one step ahead of, the, of those who are trying to enforce the subpoena. So it has contemporaneous text. It also appears to have taken time codes from the closed circuit TV inside of Mar-a-Lago that show the president's aides moving the boxes at specific times, linked up with conversations with the president, again, drawing that link between the president's intent to, to hold on to this material and the movement of the boxes. So it almost reads like a, a narrative story as the president, between the time he gets the subpoena and when the FBI finally comes to get to the boxes themselves, his efforts to hide the fact he had these documents from the authorities and and the detail and the source of the detail is what make this makes this such a tough indictment the obstruction and i do want to just detail and remind everybody what those specific charges are they were announced five days ago on thursday night i misspoke earlier forgive me uh for that um and the indictment was unsealed a day later which is when we got of course to look at it 37 
counts. These are federal charges. Let's review some of the counts in the indictment. One through 31 is willful retention of national defense information. Count 32, the conspiracy to obstruct justice. Count 33, withholding a document or record. Count 34, corruptly concealing a document or a record. Count 35, concealing a document in a federal investigation. We're, we're sort of, it sounds like I'm repeating myself, but there's a reason for this that's detailed if you read through the indictment. Count 36, scheme to conceal. Count 37, false statements and representations. And in particular, those false statements and representations, I think, which are also of note. So even after um, the archives had asked for the documents and some were turned over, then even after there was a subpoena to go and doc get those documents, there was then an affidavit by Trump's attorneys, right, that swore to the fact that everything had been turned over. And then lo and behold, a search warrant and even more documents found, a continued series of alleged obstruction by the U.S. government against Donald Trump. And if I could just break off one piece of that instruction, they are referred to as lawyers one, two, and three. Lawyers one and two are managing the subpoena and the moving of the documents, and, and lawyer one is supposed to look into the documents. Then, and all that noise you hear behind us is that conflict between the noise of the rally and the quiet of the courtroom. That lawyer number three is, there is a, there is an orchestrated, according to the indictment, effort to make. And we are understand that the booking process is complete. We want to hear now from Trump attorney and spokeswoman, Alina Haba. It is not about the 2024 election. It is about the destruction of the long-standing American principles that have set this country apart for so long. In recent years, we have seen the rise of politically motivated prosecutors who don't care for impartiality, who don't care for due process or equal pro protection of laws. They have been quietly but aggressively cultivating a two-tiered system of justice where selective treatment is the norm. From the Russia hoax to the attorney generals to the corrupt DAs in Georgia and New York, and now this, the people in charge of this country do not love America. They hate Donald Trump. What we are witnessing today is the blatant and unapologetic weaponization of the criminal justice system. The Biden appointed, appointed special counsel has sought fit to bring 37 federal charges against President Trump, the leading front runner, less than a year and a half before an election. Countless other individuals, Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden himself retained possession of classified documents that have not been prosecuted. And none of them came into possession of those documents while they were president. None of them were president who, as the head and sole member of the executive branch, has the power to summarily declassify documents. The decision to pursue charges against President Trump while turning a blind eye to others is em emblematic of the corruption that we have here. We are at a turning point in our nation's history. The targeting prosecution of a leading political opponent is the type of thing you see in dictatorships like Cuba and Venezuela. It is commonplace there for rival candidates to be prosecuted persecuted and put into jail. What is being done to the President Trump should terrify all citizens of this country. These are not the ideals that our democracy is founded upon. And this is not our America. Thank you. So what, what's happening right now inside the courthouse? It, has he been arrested? Has he been fingerprinted? Uh, has a mugshot been taken? Walk us through what's happening here now. President Trump is in a very unique position where he doesn't need to be uh, given a mugshot, obviously. He is not a flight risk. He is the leading candidate of the GOP at the moment. Um, 
He is going through a process that has been coordinated with Secret Service, and uh, it will all be handled seamlessly. Thank you, Thank you guys. The, the attorneys, the, what, what is his stand on? Just real quick, how is he feeling? He's what? defiant. And there we have the Trump's attorney and spokesperson, Alina Baba. Let's just break down a little bit what she said, John. Well, it's what she didn't say that strikes me. What she didn't say is my client didn't do any of the things alleged in all of those detailed accounts. She didn't say any of that. She went way over to the political realm, uh, which is not unfamiliar for, for former President Trump. He's done that before. But, um, you know, Robert Hur, who's the special counsel looking into Joe Biden's, uh, President Biden's classified documents, he'd be surprised to know that he's not investigating President Biden. So even what she said about uh, President Biden uh, was factually incorrect. But most importantly, she said nothing about her client's innocence on the on the charges of obstruction. Uh, she did address the idea of, of blanket declassification, which, as we talked about earlier, he undermines the former president undermines in his own uh, statements. Yeah, that message was music to the ears of Trump supporters. Even here in South Florida, you heard her refer to Cuba and Venezuela. There's so much history in South Florida as it relates to those two countries. There are a lot of exiles who live here. And so whenever you compare the U.S. to Cuba or Venezuela under Chavez or Cuba under Castro, you're sending a message to the people out here protesting, the honking of the horns, the chanting here. They are here for Donald Trump. And to hear that message it's right down their alley because it says, oh, he's being treated differently. This isn't a democracy. Well, if you look at that case, and I've, I've said this over and over again, as you know, investigators gave the former president every opportunity to turn over all the documents. And John, but isn't the opposite true? That actually the difference between the United States and Cuba and Venezuela is that no one is above the law in the United States, not even a former president of the United States. That's precisely right and that the standard is the same and so uh, presumably the independent counsel who is investigating the sitting president is using the same standard uh, as the one being applied to the former president and so that's exactly right and we should note by the way that the former attorney general Bill Barr came out this weekend and said to these questions of weaponization he said I defend the president on Russiagate I stood up and called out Alvin Bragg that's the Manhattan district attorney and I've spoken out for 30 years about the abuse of the criminal justice process to influence politics he said though about weaponization in this case it is simply not true that is a a, a, Trump, a former Trump ally and a former attorney general weighing in on precisely the charges his defense lawyer was making about weaponization. Well, I'm, let's, I'm, let's, I'm sorry. Let's dig into that particular um, point that was made by the Trump attorney with Catherine Herridge because it has been brought up repeatedly about the difference between um, now a federal criminal prosecution against Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton's emails. That was a, the difference is one between willfulness and obstruction, correct? When you Catherine? look at the case of uh, then, sorry, when you look at the case of then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Nora, that was an FBI investigation back in 2016. So again, during an election cycle, uh, just to remind, uh, then Secretary of State Clinton used a personal server for her government email and for government business, and the FBI investigation found dozens of email chains containing classified information, some at the highest levels, like what has been allegedly found at Mar-a-Lago, including what are called special access programs. These are highly classified programs that in some cases the government doesn't even acknowledge that they exist. Um, in 2016, then FBI Director James Comey said that Clinton and her team, these are his words, were extremely careless and that he did not find evidence in his view of criminal intent or willfulness. Those are the key words here, and I think that's why Special Counsel Jack Smith specifically charges, in the case of former President Donald Trump, the willful retention of national defense information. So what does that mean for a layperson? It means you have highly classified information, and the allegation is that you refuse to return it to the government, even though it's the government's property. So to break down the cases in the simplest terms, it would come down to this issue of intent. 
willfulness and obstruction. And Catherine, you laid it out so clearly in that point about why these cases are different in terms of why federal charges were brought against Donald Trump. Also want to bring in our CBS News legal analyst, Ricky Kleeman, who is following this along with us. And Ricky, you know this indictment in and out. What are the most difficult, or what is really, let's say this, what's the next step? What can Trump's attorneys do? Well, I think that's exactly the right question, Nora. And we learned a lot in the statements of Alina Haba because you cannot defend the indefensible. This indictment is so detailed and so backed up by real evidence, by the text messages, by the movement of the boxes, by the matter on tape. So what the defense must do is fight the government on motion practice. And that means they are going to file various motions to dismiss. We got it right from her. They're going to file a motion to dismiss for selective prosecution, which they will say is a denial of due process. She was very interesting to me because of looking at the law. One of the things that she said was that none of the documents were with the other people that she was talking about, having to do with President Biden, having to do with Hillary Clinton, that none of their documents did they get when they were president. And where that is leading, ultimately, Nora, is that one of the motions to dismiss is clear to me is going to be based on the Presidential Records Act because that was a civil penalty. That's how the act reads. And it is passed decades after the Espionage Act, which goes to the retention of the documents. So they are going to try to say that this should have been handled as a civil matter. And they're going to go back and look at the other Clinton. They're going to go back and look at an opinion having to do with Bill Clinton and his storing of tapes after he was president. As they say, the storage is the stock drawer. And he got to keep those tapes as personal records. And there is this unique power of the presidency to decide in the end what is personal and what is not. Understanding, of course, here, the addition is that there is alleged obstruction. Okay, Ricky, that's one point. I understand you're saying that the president's attorneys will come forward and say he can keep these classified materials under the president's Presidential Records Act. But the National Archives came out and said this is not true. All records have to be turned over. And by the way, there is no, uh, you get 60 days after you, lose, after you leave the presidency. You have to have it done before you actually leave the White House. The, the rules are clear. Bush followed the rules. Obama followed the rules. In the case of Biden, there were some documents that were not, that ended up in his, they to return back over. Pence, he had some, they were turned back over. There's, there's no ambiguity about what the Presidential Records Act says. And, and another person who's weighed in on that question is, is Bill Barr. Attorney General Bill Barr, who said he in no way had a right to these records. If, if he were to claim that this was a, there was a personal letter, there is some, there you can have a debate about that if it's highly personal, but not, not these kinds of records, which are the property of the United States. Let's keep going through some of these uh, ways that I think Trump attorneys are going to try to argue this case. But first, I want to bring in our chief campaign correspondent, Robert Costa, because he's outside the courthouse in Miami. He's done such a incredible reporting on this and really maybe even before the Trump team can make uh, their counter argument they have to come up with a team right why are they still scrambling to put together a team for the former president of the United States what's gone on Nora, when you step back and look at the past 10 days or so the past 10 days have been effectively a century for the Trump legal team. They have had so much upheaval. It was just a few Mondays ago they went to the Justice Department, two lawyers, Jim Trusty and John Rowley, and had a meeting with the special counsel explaining their concerns. Yet just days later, the indictment's unsealed. It gets very real. Then those lawyers leave the legal team. Now Trump trying to bring on new people. But it's complicated for the former president because he's here in Florida. Many lawyers are not 
able to practice necessarily in federal court in Florida unless they're really granted approval to do so. It's much different in Washington where it seems like a lawyer is on every street corner going down K Street. And so now you have a former president meeting with his team, expressing so much grievance behind the scenes. Last night at Doral, on his campaign plane, we're told, talking to friends on the phone. But when it comes to a legal strategy, yes, fighting, fighting, fighting can be one. But at the end of the day, the special counsel and the federal judge are not always predictable. Now, the Trump camp is hoping that Judge Eileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, will end up overseeing this case in the coming months. And something to pay attention to now is when does Judge Cannon, if it does end up being her, as we expect, when does she set the next meeting for Trump or his lawyers to come before the court? The special counsel has asked for a speedy trial because of what's all swirling around this case. But if the judge says we're only going to meet in a month or two, that means this could be a protracted process that takes the former president deep into the campaign next year. He could be having court appearances in New York, in Georgia, if he's indicted there, here in Florida, all while he's running for the nomination in places like Iowa and New Hampshire. Robert, is it possible that the former president is having trouble hiring some new lawyers because he's dismissed so many in the past or so many have resigned? When you look at former President Trump's career, there have always been high-profile, controversial advisors and often attorneys. Think about Roy Cohn, who was at Trump's side in the 70s and 80s before he died. Then there was Michael Cohen, his longtime fixer. But Trump, as much as he wants television lawyers, people who can be brash brawlers in television appearances with the press, he also needs veteran defense attorneys, often with his real estate deers, but now with his a criminal trial, who take this seriously, who know the law. Because when you're dealing with the special counsel, it's not like sparring in a green room or on a television show. You have to really know the law on a federal level, on a criminal level. And if you're that kind of lawyer, you're going to probably take some pause before you sign on to this kind of case. So Todd Blanche, one of the more respected lawyers in this area, he has signed on with Trump and he has left his firm, a, high, a prominent firm. So Trump is now, we're told by many sources, telling Todd Blanche, who's very low key, doesn't go on TV, to be a killer for him, Trump's words behind the scenes, and try to sew this up for him legally. Robert Costa, thank you. And just to let everyone know, former President Donald Trump is inside this courtroom right behind me, this federal courthouse. He has been booked uh, for 37 federal counts against the former president of the United States. He is the only current or former president who has faced federal charges of this kind, the special counsel. Uh, alleging that what Donald Trump did put national security at risk. Jeff Pegues was actually near the special counsel Jack Smith last night. Tell us about that. Uh, quite unexpectedly, I was flying down to Miami and I was at the airport in D.C. and noticed this guy with this beard walking up. If you've seen a, a, a photograph of him or video of him, there he is. And I, I think that's my video. If you if you see a photograph of him, you you see that distinctive beard. What else I noticed is that no one recognized him except me. You know, here is the guy tasked with taking on a former president. Nobody right now knows who he is. In fact, I heard somebody in the crowd say, "Oh, I think that's one of Donald Trump's attorneys," and I sort of chuckled. But he's all business. He is well, all business. But And did you also notice, because just this weekend, Donald Trump called him a deranged psycho, uh, this uh, uh, federal attorney, this uh, special counsel who's worked for the government, has prosecuted war criminals. He had a lot of security around him? Uh, he had some security, but he, he seemed off to himself. He was sitting a few rows back, just just behind the exit row in a little window seat. The plane was packed. You know, you'd think that the DOJ would have some special jet to send him down on, but no, no he flew commercial.
yeah. like the rest of us. Well, as Gail King always says, stars, they're just like us. But in this case, special counsels, they're just like us. They fly. <laughs> That's right. And in this case, fly commercial. And he was in economy class? He was in economy class with the rest of us. But he didn't smile. I didn't see him smile well, at all. These are very serious charges, no, no doubt, that he is um, bringing against us. And I want to ask you, too, about... Um, John, because right now the president inside, we will never get pictures of what happened inside, but it is a moment to go from being the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, to have to stand before a magistrate and hear these charges and then plead not guilty and think about, and he has escaped accountability in the past and believes he is the focus of uh, political persecution, but this is distinct. It is distinct, and also it's distinct in with respect to all the previous uh, clashes Donald Trump has had, either with the impeachments or with anything else, because he always asserted that he never did anything wrong. But the behavior contained in this indictment is the behavior of a person running around trying to get away from authorities. There is detailed accounts of him knowing that, according to the indictment and the details seem to spell this out, knowing that he is doing something that he's not supposed to be doing. Yeah. And so if he carries that into the courtroom with him, he's got to have prob a deeper, one would imagine, sense of his own peril in this instance than in previous As ones. you pointed out, your analysis from reading this indictment, Donald Trump refers to them as my boxes, even though they are presidential records and they are government documents. He refers to them in the context when he calls them my boxes. He didn't even want his personal aide to show them to his attorney. That's Kevin right. Corcoran. That's right. He didn't. And, he, and when he says, I don't want you going through my boxes, I really don't, is one of the quotes contained in the indictment. Uh, and that was to go through the boxes for the purposes of complying with a subpoena. This gets to the obstruction question. And that was one of five instances in which the president, according to, to the indictment, orchestrated activity to thwart the federal uh, authorities looking for these documents, which he did not have the right to have. I want to bring in now Timothy Parlatori. He served as a Trump attorney, but left due to differences with Trump advisor Boris Epstein. Mr. Parlatori joins us now, and good to see you. Um, thank you so much for joining us. So have you spoken with any of the former president's attorneys about their strategy to defend him? What's next? I have not spoken with any of the uh, any of the current team about this. You know, my my, my tenure on the legal team ended in uh, about a month ago, and you know, certainly I remain you know close with uh, John Rowley and Jim Trusty, but uh, I'm not in contact with the current team. Tim, do you know? I mean, how many different attorneys has Donald Trump had recently, and how many of them resigned, and why? Well, look, he has a lot of different attorneys because he has a lot of different cases. And, you know, I can't really speak for anybody else. You know, I have my reasons, which I did uh, discuss at the time that I left. It's not something I really want to, you know, belabor. Um, it's difficult to represent a client in a case like this when there are um, other influences at play. So that's why I felt that it was best for me to leave. And... You know, certainly, I hope that he will find the team that can properly defend him in this case. No doubt you have read through all 49 pages of this indictment and looked closely at some of the evidence in this indictment. The former Attorney General Bill Barr calls this a very, very damning indictment. Is he wrong? Well, I think that the problem is you look at the indictment and if you just read it by itself uh, and you assume that everything in it is true and you kind of ignore uh, a lot of the conduct of the DOJ team in getting to this point, it can look that way. However, you know, as a criminal defense attorney, one of the things that I do for a living is I take documents like this, I look at them a little bit more skeptically, I then go through the evidence to see if it actually matches up. And oftentimes it doesn't. DOJ oftentimes will bring indictments where by the time we get to discovery, we realize these aren't true, you know, the, the, or they're certainly not as airtight. Maybe there are 30 witnesses that say something one way, a couple that say something the other way, and they'll just write what some of the witnesses said instead of the rest. Okay, well, so Tim, what specifically? Just because what it's, it looks damning. Specifically? 
Well, yeah, the thing that jumped out to me specifically is kind of the big hurdle that they're going to have to overcome is the exchange between Trump and Walt Nada uh, before Evan did his search, which they claim is based on all these you know, video surveillance and phone records. And if that's true, then that's a pretty big hurdle. But at the same time, if that's true, then it's something that they would have used before now to try and convince Walt Nada to change his story. And so the kind of the manner in which the investigation was conducted surrounding that undermines the credibility of that. All right, I understand your point, but I'm not sure that the 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 body man or the personal aide or the valet is central to this case. I think some of the most damning evidence comes from Trump's former attorney, Evan Corcoran. And so on that note, I wonder, because as you know, the crime fraud exemption exception was used, granted by a federal judge to pierce the attorney client privilege, which then allowed uh, the notes and voice memos uh, to be administered, in which uh, if you believe uh, what is in the indictment, um, it's more evidence that Donald Trump continued to try and obstruct a federal investigation in an effort to return these presidential records. Do you believe that Trump's new attorneys will try and dismiss the testimony of Evan Corcoran? I think that the testimony of Evan Corcoran is something that will be suppressed because I believe, you know, Judge Howell's decision on the crime fraud exception there was wrong. And I think it is something that Judge Cannon will have to, you know, reevaluate. Unfortunately, when you're litigating these issues in the context of grand jury proceedings, because of secrecy laws, it's not the same as you when you ordinarily litigate a motion. The government puts forth their case, which the defense is not allowed to see. We then have to respond to arguments that we're not allowed to read or know what they have argued. And ultimately, the judge makes that decision based on really only hearing intelligent, you know, coherent arguments from one side because the other side is totally in the dark. Now that we've actually gone through this and seen all the notes, it's clear to me that these are proper attorney-client communications, not something that should ever have been disclosed. And if you look at those specific uh, discussions, what even, he's asking there is... Even if it was in furtherance is, of a crime? What? Tim. But no, it's Tim, not, Tim but I it's want not. to ask you on Just that. Just because, because you charge I understand some. that. I agree. Everybody believes... No, no. I know this is a very, very rare exception. This is almost never pierced. Attorney-client privilege is never pierced. Correct. But my understanding is that Judge Howell, Correct. who allowed the crime fraud exception, said that the government made a prima facie showing that Trump committed a criminal offense and that the evidence was a transcript of audio notes that Corcoran made. I mean, this is so rare. And Trump lost this before a grand jury. So, again, give me your best argument about why you think this will be suppressed. Because Judge Howell, in my opinion, got it wrong. She didn't hear from the other side. We weren't able to fully litigate the motion. And now that you see what's in the notes, it's clear that she got it wrong because these are attorney client privileged communications. He's asking about what are we required to do? What are we allowed to do? And one thing that's kind of lost in what's in the indictment is the context here where he's specifically saying, look, I read about when Hillary Clinton got a subpoena and David Kendall deleted 33,000 emails. Are we allowed to do the same thing because they didn't get into trouble? You want clients to ask you those kinds of questions. You want to encourage them to ask those kind of questions so that they understand what their rights are, what their responsibilities are. But you want them to discuss that in an attorney-client privileged environment. And I think that the precedent that Jack Smith is trying to set here is extraordinarily dangerous because what he's trying to set here is if you ask a question to your attorney that the answer is no, then the government is going to try and pierce attorney-client privilege and then charge you for asking a question. It's very dangerous. It's very unconstitutional. It's not something that he should be doing or that anybody in DOJ should be doing. And any attorney who has actually counseled clients who have received grand jury subpoenas will look at this with the full context and know there's nothing criminal about that, that exchange. And so, therefore, it should never have been disclosed. Yeah, you know, there is potentially a crime fraud exception argument for 
Evan saying when he was going to do the search. Just that piece of it so that that could be in furtherance of when Walt Nada moved the boxes. That doesn't mean you give over all of these other pages of notes and all of these other attorney-client privileged communications. And I think that that did irreparably taint the grand jury proceedings. And moreover, Judge Howell, when she rendered that decision, she didn't give us the opportunity to appeal. Ordinarily, you have a couple of days to appeal before they hand over the notes, and you go to the circuit and you try and stay it. She didn't wait. She immediately gave the notes over to the prosecutors, thereby mooting the appeal so that we wouldn't be allowed to go up. So that's something that I think that the trial judge is going to take a hard look at. And really, I would expect that this would get reversed and go back and say, no, this was not properly disclosed. Tim Parlatore, former attorney for Donald Trump. Thank you, Tim, for joining us. And just for those following along at home with a printed out copy of the indictment like I am here, sitting outside where the, there's cars honking behind me in a helicopter, so if it's a bit noisy, I apologize. But for those following along, on page 21 of your indictment right here, you can see is the actual exchange um, between Trump and Trump attorney one, where Donald Trump says, I don't want anybody looking. I don't want anybody looking through my boxes. I really don't. I don't want you looking through my boxes. And then Trump says, well, what if it happens we just don't respond at all or don't play ball with them? See, wouldn't it be better if we just told them we don't have anything here? D, well, look, isn't it better if there are no documents? And as summarized in the beginning of the indictment, the special counsel alleges that his Trump suggested his attorney falsely represent the FBI and the grand jury that Trump did not have documents called for by the subpoena. That is, according to Judge Howell, why they were able to pierce this attorney-client privilege. I want to bring in Scott Fredrickson. He is a former federal prosecutor. Uh, he is also uh, with us. And Scott, let's drill down on that very argument. I mean, in your mind, how crucial is um, the evidence provided by Trump's former attorney, Evan Corcoran, in this indictment? Well, that evidence is absolutely crucial. It's part of the obstruction case. And in this case, as much as it is about classified documents, it's about the obstruction uh, of the criminal investigation, all that occurs after the subpoena. Um, so it's not a surprise that they will attack uh, the, uh, the evidence stemming from Evan Corcoran's notes. Um, that said, uh, Judge Beryl Hall uh, wrote a detailed memorandum uh, to support her holding. There are overwhelming facts supporting why the attorney-client privilege uh, was pierced here. And it does happen, but it only happens when there's clear evidence uh, of an attempt to commit a crime. And it's hard to imagine anything more clear than the notes of the attorney himself. Look, the reason he made those notes is because he was scared. He just had his client ask him, hey, wouldn't it be better if we just didn't have any documents? What if we just don't play ball? What if we just say no? And then he recounts the situation where uh, his client says, well, take a look at these documents that he's supposed to review. And he does a plucking motion according to Mr. Trump's own attorney, which he interpreted as get rid of them. Uh, now, if that's not enough, we also have the evidence that I suspect Judge Howell had um, that resulted in the false certification to the government that all the documents had been supplied, when in fact they had not. You've got videotapes of the boxes being moved around um, to mislead Evan Corcoran himself so he didn't know what all the documents. That's overwhelming evidence. You won't see a stronger case of uh, the crime fraud exception than there. So I, I think we just heard one of the uh, main defense arguments here. Um, but that's not going to carry the day. There's a very strong factual basis. Judge Howell held hearings on it, wrote a detailed uh, memorandum opinion 
to support the basis of it. No one right. takes this anything but seriously, but that's going to stand up in this uh, case. Got it. And Scott, um, I'm going to get Ricky Kleeman on this in just a minute, but I just want to ask you about what's happening behind us right here in this federal courthouse. Describe what's happening to Donald Trump right now as he has been booked and is appearing before this magistrate. Right now, he's uh, likely uh, seated in the, the uh, ceremonial uh, courtroom. There's a big crowd in there, reporters uh, who are all dying to get on the phone and, and talk. Uh, the judge, the magistrate judge, is uh, speaking and advising him of his rights, including the right to have the indictment read to him, which he can waive. And ultimately, he will ask uh, how uh, Mr. Trump wishes to plead. Uh, the former president likely will state in very clear tones, I plead not guilty. Uh, then, uh, in all likelihood, on the next date uh, for uh, the hearing before Judge Cannon will be set, doesn't have to be. Judge Cannon may issue an order on her own setting up a schedule for the first hearing to set dates for pretrial uh, hearings for motions, briefing schedule, and uh, potential uh, trial date. We won't see that today. Uh, we won't see that until the first hearing by Judge Cannon. Scott Fredrickson, thank you. I want to bring in our CBS News legal analyst, Ricky Clayman. And Ricky, as we talk about what options um, the Trump's attorneys have, I mean, are they limited in nature? What, where do you think they'll, what do you think their best effort is in terms of this, delaying a trial? The defense always looks at delay, 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 and Donald Trump is the champion of delay. At the same time, you're going to see motion upon motion to dismiss in this case because that's the only place that they could put their eggs in that basket. And how will they do that? They will have deadlines to file motions to dismiss. And I think that they will file various motions. Another motion we've just heard argued very eloquently on the part of the government's point of view by Scott and the part of the defense part point of view by Tim Parlator. Big, big hearing on the issue of the testimony of Evan Corcoran and the crime fraud exception to break the attorney-client privilege. Remember, Nora, we're in another jurisdiction. We have another court and we have the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. The issue about whether or not Evan Corcoran can testify against his own client is an issue that is going to delay this trial because it must be decided before the trial begins. And what about Judge Eileen Cannon? She is the newest judge in the Southern District Courts. She has ruled deferentially for Trump last summer, assigning an arbiter, remember, to look through the documents seized by the FBI at Mar-a-Lago. What impact do you think she'll have? She can have a great impact because of the advantage to defend and to delay. This is a rocket docket jurisdiction, Nora. That means the cases are supposed to go to trial, which will never happen within 70 days, or at least within six months. She has the ability with a motion to dismiss practice, with discovery deadlines, to make this case go on and on if she chooses to do so. If she wants to go by rocket docket deadlines, this case will go very fast. A lot of power in the judge. Ricky Kleeman, thank you. Want to bring in Robert Costa on this matter. And Robert, what about the location of this potential trial and Judge Cannon? We're going to learn a lot, Nora, in the coming hours about how this is going to unfold, about whether the next appearance will be in Miami for this case or whether it will end up in West Palm Beach. Behind the scenes, Trump allies and lawyers are optimistic about Judge Cannon. They look at how she handled that so-called special master request to review the documents, and they believe that she might have some skepticism about how the government has gone about this case. And that's why in your interview with Timothy Parlatori, you sense a bit of confidence on the Trump side, even among his former lawyers, that because the government was aggressive in, in investigating these documents and trying to secure them, especially by cutting through attorney-client privilege by having that so-called crime fraud exception, that Judge Cannon could give them a hearing. 
But the government side of this, based on our reporting, is that the evidence is so widespread, it's piled up so high in terms of details and interviews with witnesses. I have been reporting on this investigation for months, and it's stunning to me as a reporter to see the scope of how many people were spoken to by this special counsel and the, heard by the grand jury, from those on the janitorial staff to minor low-level aides for the president's political operation, his personal operation, to all the staff at Mar-a-Lago. You know, Robert, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is you've done so much reporting on this and analysis that even as many people look at this indictment and say it is voluminous in its evidence against Donald Trump, including uh, some of the testimony provided by Evan Corcoran, there is still a discovery process that will go on as part of a trial. And the idea that this indictment is just a selection of what prosecutors have discovered. What else could be out there? When you step back and think about what's happening today, it's easy to be almost in a, an isolated state of mind that this is one explosive investigation of a former president. But it's important to remember and I have to sometimes remind myself that the special counsel is also still investigating Trump on January 6th. And that's an aggressive investigation as well, still hearing from witnesses. So some of these people in Trump's orbit who have been interviewed on the records case are also being talked to on the January 6th case, which Jack Smith, the special counsel, is helming. So there are two tracks going simultaneously, compiling evidence even as this moves to trial. And there's that looming possible indictment in Georgia. So what they're trying to do, whether it's in Fulton County, Georgia, or with the special counsel in Washington, is see if there will be any cracks with some of these witnesses. Someone like Walt Nauta, he's now been indicted and processed in federal court. Does he start to reveal more as the pressure mounts? We've seen this in Trump investigation after Trump investigation. The government has one real weapon, and that's time, patience, to see if people will break and start to talk. But Walt Nauta, that um, Nauta, the uh, president's valet, I mean, you're talking about him breaking with the president, but last night he was breaking bread with Donald Trump over dinner. What's the likelihood that that loyalty could be severed? Nora, when I sat down in recent weeks with Michael Cohen, Trump's former fixer, he regaled me with stories of the past when, when you're in Donald Trump's inner circle, you're sitting on a plane that's called Trump Force One, and some of the accoutrements in the plane, even the bathroom, some of the facilities in gold. And it's a lifestyle for some of these aides around Trump that's enthralling. They like being close to power, close to the flame. But ultimately, even for someone like Michael Cohen, the legal pressure becomes too much. And he has become one of Trump's fiercest critics. That's not to say that Mr. Nada is going to become a Michael Cohen-type figure. But the government has a way of talking to people through these investigations and really laying out on the line what's on the, what, if you look at the back of this indictment, what does it have? Prison sentences. And we're not talking about a few months, we're talking about a few decades. Robert Costa, thank you. Talking about Walt Nada, who served 20 years in the U.S. Navy, worked uh, in the mess at the White House, because the Navy runs the mess at the White House, and then became very close with Donald Trump and then retired from the Navy and has stayed with the president at Mar-a-Lago. John Dickerson. May I add just a point back to um, Eileen Cannon, the judge who will have this matter before her. Um, uh, possibly favorable to the former president, but we should also remember that previously when she ruled, she was overturned by the appeals court. And when they overturned her decision, they mentioned the appeals court did. What you mentioned earlier is the concept of no one is above the law. And they, the appeals court said in her previous re ruling that if her previous ruling were to stay, it would create a special exception which would defy our nation's foundational principle that our law applies to all without regard to numbers, wealth, or rank. So while the judge has tremendous amount of authority there is also an appeals court above that has already looked at this question of whether a president should have special favor and ruled against the judge. So that is a part of important context here. Thank you for that. And CBS News has just learned that Trump has entered the courtroom with his lawyers. This is about 50 minutes after being booked. 
Um, also in the front row is the special counsel, Jack Smith, and this arraignment hearing has begun. Again, this is the federal courthouse here in Miami right behind us. That noise that you hear are mostly supporters of Donald Trump who have gathered at some points shouting, we want Trump. Most of them have on their red, white, and blue outfits in their Trump regalia um, here hoping to catch a glimpse of Donald Trump, but we may never see him because he pulled into the garage below uh, this large office building behind us. We should point out that we understand that Donald Trump is in a ceremonial courtroom on the 13th floor, which is about directly across from the law offices uh, where we are. Um, extraordinary to think Donald Trump now facing these federal charges against him, which are very serious. And uh, even as he does not have a full legal team in order to defend him and for what is expected to be a speedy trial, unless they're able to file these motions to delay things. Which, which we know they will do. Uh, and then, and then it really that does come down then to uh, to the judge. Mm -hmm. But to build on some of the things that you talked about here, that indictment, you know, we've all read indictments in the past. There's something sort of unique about that one in that it, it reads like a novel. There are a lot of specifics in there. And I've talked to sources in law enforcement who anticipated uh, some of the questions about the indictment that President Trump, former President Trump and his supporters might raise. And so everything laid out in that indictment is there for a reason, including those pictures, which I don't know if we show those enough, because remember, those documents were being stored in bathrooms and ballrooms and what, uh, storage rooms. And what's important about well, that is not just that it's kind of amusing, uh, but that it was an attempt to get ahead of the law. And that's why it had to sort of any clear open room available. Well, actually, one of the things that I thought was really interesting, and there have been some uh, excellent graphics put together about where are these storage rooms. Remember, Mar-a-Lago is not his home. He has a residence on what is a resort. It is a club. It's an expensive club to join. I believe it's now a couple hundred thousand dollars to join Mar-a-Lago. But this private club hosted 150 events from January 2001 to August, excuse me, 2021 to January 2020-21, which is when Trump left office, to August 2022. There were 150 events. We're talking about weddings, fundraisers, you name it. We're talking about more than 10,000 people. There's, the, there's Mar-a-Lago right there. So they were first in the white and gold ballroom. Well, then they had to move that. Sometimes they were in the lake room. Then they went to the Trump family suite in Pine Hall, but then they needed to put staffers there. So then Trump ordered the storage area to be cleared out. Well, that storage area is right by a door that's right by the pool where everybody hangs out and right by where they keep all the liquor. Right. So it's an area where there's lots of staff that work on that property. It's a resort. It's a it's a, a club. You know, it's a lot of people hanging around there, walking in and out. Why why should documents? Is this uh, alleges that where there are many top secret documents that are from seven different of our top intelligence agencies: the CIA, the DOD, the National Security Agency, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the National Reconnaissance Office, the Department of Energy in charge of our nuclear secrets, the Department of State. Bureau of Intelligence and Research. These documents are in a storage room near where the liquor is kept. Right, right. It is, it is pretty... The bathroom, I know, is amusing for people. And that's why. But the storage room, you know, underneath the resort, where lots of people go in and out to get boxes of liquor and the pool chairs and that kind of stuff. Right. It, 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 but it speaks to the higgledy-piggledy nature of the former president, as outlined in the indictment, to keep them anywhere so they wouldn't be find, found, including by his own legal team, in some of the ways that the outline of the indictment puts it. I mean, these aren't the Christmas ornaments. These are the most sensitive parts of American intelligence. 
And that, of course, raises a second political question, just if we can touch on it briefly. This is a person who's being asked to be given the responsibility to handle these kinds of secrets again. And the central question of that is, will you be a steward of the nation's most important secrets and national security for the betterment of the nation, or will you use them for your private purposes? And these documents he was using, the indictment alleges, and others who know him know, he was using to settle scores, to show off, not what the uh, intelligence agencies put these documents together for. Well, and again, this is a former president of the United States. This isn't some low-level, entry-level uh, employee of the NSA, CIA, CIA, FBI. This is the former president of the United States, who also, by the way, has the finances to build a skiff. Yeah, but there have been former national security aides. Sandy Berger comes to mind, who brought a, a document out in a sock and yeah, time but not right? that many. Documents. No, no, I know. That's what I'm but saying for busted. lesser charges. Yeah. 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 Let's bring in Robert Costa on this matter because, Robert, I know you have been to Mar a Lago as well. And the idea about oh, oh, these oh. documents being moved around the property numerous times, which are the texts that are detailed in this indictment between Walt Nada and another unnamed Mar a Lago employee. Robert Costa. Uh, forgive me, it's a bit noisy here with a lot of the protests, so I'm going to come back to Robert in just a second. I want to go to Catherine Herridge on this matter because, Catherine, I know you've been digging into this as well. Your reporting and specifically what this indictment details about the type of classification of these documents, some of the nation's most tightly held secrets, they were as part of these uh, documents and in boxes. What do we know about them? Well, that's right, Northa. You, you raised an excellent point about the storage of these records at Mar-a-Lago. Really, they should be held in what's called a skiff or a secure facility. That means that it's tightly controlled and restricted and designed so that our adversaries cannot get access to that information. I'm going to toss it back to you, Nora, right now. Catherine Herridge, thank you. I want to go now to Scott McFarlane, who has just come out from inside the courthouse. He has new information. Scott? Moments ago, through his attorney, Todd Blanche, former President Trump pleaded not guilty to these 37 federal charges. And Todd Blanche, in fact, said the former president is, quote, most certainly pleading not guilty. The former president sat in navy blue suit, red tie, hunched over at the table, his hands folded at first, then his arms folded, expressionless, not saying a word. It was his defense attorney who stood and said he's not guilty to these charges. The proceedings are ongoing. They're going to talk about release conditions. They're going to talk about future scheduling, the dates of the next hearings. But before the hearing began, the former president was booked. He was processed, digital fingerprints taken. No booking photo. The marshals deemed it unnecessary. They think there's enough photos of Donald Trump out there to use for the purposes of his prosecution. There's a ongoing proceeding, Nora, that'll take about four or five more minutes, and ultimately the former president's expected to leave soon after. Describe the atmosphere, Scott. What was it like? A packed courtroom and a rather large courtroom on the 13th floor of this federal courthouse in Miami. The former president had all of his attorneys in a row at the table. It's Todd Blanche out of New York. It's a man named Chris Kyes, an attorney out of Florida, or who is now uh, certified to represent him here in the Southern District of Florida. His co-defendant, Walt Nada, sat at the same table with his attorney. They're all together at the same table. We noted the judge, Jonathan Goodman, who is handling this case just for one day here in Miami, before handing it off to a district judge, referred to Donald Trump multiple times in court as former President Trump, not as the defendant, not as Mr. Trump, not as Trump, but as former President Trump. It's a beautiful courtroom, chestnut wood walls about the size of a small school cafeteria, royal blue carpet. The former president had a stack of papers in front of him at the defense table, but no pen, wasn't writing, wasn't talking, just sat expressionless, kind of hunched over, hands on the table, then arms folded. His attorney, Todd Blanche, was occasionally whispering things in his ear, but this was a moment the former president knew was happening 
outside the view of cameras. The federal courthouse is a ban on cameras. He is largely operating and acting invisibly in this courtroom. The judge, Jonathan Goodman, gaveled this into session right on time, right about 3 o'clock here on the East Coast. It should be over in short order. So, Scott, uh, Donald Trump has been inside this federal courthouse for more than an hour now. What's been happening? What do you expect has to be done before he leaves? Well, they booked him in the courthouse itself. From what CBS News has been told from law enforcement officials is that they booked him here in an office space inside the courthouse, either out of convenience due to the significant security in and outside the courthouse or potentially for everybody's safety. Oftentimes in this district of Florida, they'll book you in a different building and bring you from the courthouse over to there. They did it right in an empty office space inside the courthouse. He arrived, according to the marshals, about an hour in advance of getting into the courtroom. They took those fingerprints. They took his social security number, his birth date, all the things you get from a criminal defendant for the booking process. Process. As I mentioned earlier, no booking photo in this case, but Donald Trump has an official case number. It's 23-CR80101. Quite a thing for a former president to have a federal criminal case number. He has been assigned a pretrial services officer. This is all uncharted waters, all history in the making here at the federal courthouse in Miami. We expect to hear before the proceeding ends, likely in the coming minutes, what release conditions have been ordered for the former president? What restrictions will he be under now that he's a federal criminal defendant? And likely we'll get a sense of the calendar, at least the next steps in the calendar. Is the next hearing going to be scheduled in a matter of weeks, in a matter of months? And will this case, which was earmarked for West Palm Beach, Florida, the courthouse nearest Mar-a-Lago, actually remain here in Miami? This is a huge, cavernous courthouse that has I think some people would argue the security footprint necessary for court hearings and potentially a trial of a former president. It will most certainly be an attraction. And did we hear from the special counsel, Jack Smith, at all? We spotted Jack Smith in the front row in one of the wooden benches. The courtroom had two pairs of five row deep benches for spectators, and it was filled to the brim today. Jack Smith sitting directly behind the special counsel attorney who is presenting this case. That special counsel staffer is named David Harbaugh. There's another special counsel prosecutor there, an investigator named Jay Bratt. And we go left to right at the defense table. If you're the judge facing the courtroom, at the far left is a man named Stanley Woodward. He's the defense attorney representing Trump's co-defendant, Walt Nada. Nada is next to Woodward. Next to Nada at the defense table was Todd Blanche, the New York City-based defense attorney for Donald Trump, who's also representing him in that Manhattan prosecution. Then there's Donald Trump, Navy suit, red tie, papers in front of him, hands folded, saying nothing. On the far right of that table is the other attorney, Chris Kyes. At the prosecution or the special counsel table, you had David Harbaugh, the special counsel staffer who spoke today, and Jay Bratt. The rows behind the special counsel table included the special counsel himself, Jack Smith, and a number of media members. Behind the defense table, a whole series of media members and several members of the public who won a lottery to get a seat in the courthouse and in the courtroom for this unique historic day. Jeff Begays is here as well, and I know has some questions for you, Scott. Mm, Scott, see, we, we know how much Scott loves courtrooms. He was in the courtroom for the Manhattan case as well. And so I was wondering if you could contrast and compare uh, in terms of the former president's demeanor. How did he look today? How did, uh, what was his demeanor? Uh, especially as if you compare it to the video that we saw at the arraignment in New York City in early April. Identical, Jeff. Same mannerism, same body language, same expression on his face. And we had an advantage of perspective today. We were in the overflow room where there was a video feed giving us a head-on picture 
of Donald Trump. Those in the courtroom only saw the back of his head. We could see his face. We could see his expression. The overflow room is actually the jury meeting room here with 300 seats and a few tiny televisions. So small, the, the kind of televisions you get in a low-cost hotel room. We watched this on TV and through a feed, and we could see, even through the grainy picture, Donald Trump sitting, no expression, nothing to say, idle at the table with his hands folded. So, uh, Scott, we know uh, South Florida has a reputation of being one of those uh, areas where court cases move quickly through the system. What do you expect in terms of the progress of this case? Is this something, because we know prosecutors want a speedy trial, do you think they'll get what they want? Jack Smith has already articulated that. He said so much during his news event, news conference last week, that he is going to seek a speedy trial. You're right. This is one of those districts in America, the Southern District of Florida, which is known as a rocket docket, a place where cases move expediently compared to other federal courts in America. But so much of this is going to be up to the parties. Does the defense choose to slow this down? Does the defense choose to file motions to potentially delay things or make this case move more sluggishly. That's going to be in the hands of the parties, but this case is still earmarked for Judge Eileen Cannon. We learned that today in the arraignment. Judge Cannon, based in Fort Pierce, Florida, a ways to the north of here. She, of course, was a Trump appointee. You may recall her name. She was the judge who oversaw litigation and challenges to the search warrant last year. She has this case, at least for now, and some of the timing could ultimately be up to her. All right, Scott McFarlane, who has just come from inside the courthouse with that detailed account of not only the mahogany and blue curtains, but also uh, the former president um, and his legal team sitting next to his valet, Walt Nada, and what's happening inside, as well as the special counsel in this uh, historic arraignment as the president, former president of the United States has been booked and is now facing 37 federal counts. Scott McFarland, thank you so much. I want to bring in South Carolina Republican Representative Nancy Mace. She worked on Trump's 2016 presidential campaign and in 2021 voted against impeaching Trump in relation to the Capitol assault, but she did not uh, condemn his actions. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I want to ask you, did you read through the whole 49-page indictment? I, I absolutely did. Uh, I try to educate myself on what's actually happening, but I have to be honest with you. And I, I'm someone, I've had my ups and downs with Donald Trump over the years. We've had, that's been very public. But I just can't get beyond the fact that the precedent for how we handle classified information was first set when the DOJ and the FBI decided not to indict Hillary Clinton, who had a private server, who had classified information on that server, server, who obstructed justice, wasn't even president, wasn't even a former president, but was, a, was going to be a presidential candidate. And that was the precedent that was I've set. I've heard you and make this today, argument, Congresswoman. I know, but then I see this today, Thank you, Congresswoman. and it really is I've shocking heard... to me. Yes, and I as wanted to drill down to on that because, because if you read today, the indictment, it's, it's, Shameful. If you read the indictment, you notice that it that it mentioned the willful retention of documents. And so the distinction that has been made in the case of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump is the willful retention of documents, as is laid out, and a question of obstruction. Um, that the president repeatedly was told about his actions and he repeatedly obstructed justice. You see any distinction there? Well, I, I will say today, when I watch what's happening in this country, the FBI had access to all those boxes in every single room, and the precedent was set under Clinton that she would not be in debt. I think it's worthwhile to have a conversation about how we handle classified information post-presidency. I think that is a worthwhile debate, because we want to protect our nation's secrets, okay? I want to get that off the bat. 
But the precedent was set under Clinton. She had a private server. I can't think of anything more willful than hiding a server in your bathroom in your home. I can't think of anything more willful than using hammers on your own telephone, cell phone devices, and your iPads to obstruct justice and then to be let off. And so if that's the standard, then it should apply to everyone, including Donald Trump. But clearly you don't think that should be the standard. That's the argument that no, you're I trying to make. So you believe that I Hillary Clinton should be held should to be. a different... You think Hillary Clinton think should Hillary be held to a higher standard, and so then you must also agree, therefore, that Donald Trump should be held to that same high standard. But that's not the standard, because under Hillary Clinton, she was let go. She was not indicted. She did. She had classified documents on her server. They tried to obstruct it, and she was able to walk away. So if that's the standard, then you had Mike Pence, who had classified documents in his home. Then you had Joe Biden, who had classified documents spread across the country in different boxes, including unsecured in his garage. If, he, if Trump's going to be indicted, so too then should be Joe Biden. I also can't get beyond the fact that, that every time we find corruption, evidence of corruption on Joe Biden, Donald Trump gets indicted. I mean, that's what I see just as an everyday American, as someone who hasn't seen eye to eye with Donald Trump, and that's how we're going to operate. I don't think it's the right way, and I think it's shameful what's happening today. Congresswoman, I understand um, you represent the first district of South Carolina, which is the suburban areas of north and east of Charleston, yep. and you served on the Armed Services Committee, right? How many military yes, members correct. do you represent? We have about half of all the bases. How many in the state members of, South of the Carolina. military? I, I'd have to go back and look, but about half of all the bases in the state of South Carolina reside in the low country of South Carolina, the area that I represent. How would you rate the importance of protecting those members who serve in the military that are in your district and in the state of Always South Carolina? protecting our national security should be a top priority. But Donald Trump is held to a different standard than our own president today by, by anybody else, and even Hillary Clinton, who was able to walk away by obstructing justice. And the Justice Department and the FBI said she did nothing wrong. So if that's the standard, then why is Donald Trump treated differently? At the end of the day, I think that's why or where the average American is going to see this headed. It's not the same standard to indict him but not indict anybody else. Now, I think we should protect our national secrets. I also understand. I don't want to see boxes of classified information that are unsecured. But Joe Biden had classified information in his garage, unsecured, sitting next to his Corvette, and God knows where else in this country. So he should be indicted or be Where is that same information now? Trump. And well, Congressman, where, where, what collected. happened to that information when it was revealed? Hopefully it's been collected by Immediately the government. Immediately collected? Right. But where so, is so he's he? Had, he had over once they found out about it, they returned of it. information, including classified documents. So that's the standard. And I think Donald Trump's being treated unfairly here. So I, I was, I was asking you about your. That's I hear you. I was asking Absolutely. you about your district, though. <laughs> Don't you want to talk about yes. your district? I was asking you about your district. Um, yes, and I answered I understand. your question, so your which district was include to say joint about base half Charleston? of all the bases, if you'd let me speak, I said about half of all the bases in South Carolina are in the low country of South Carolina. That I represent on the House Armed Services Committee. I've said it like And how important now. is it to preserve nuclear... I don't know nuclear, if you can hear me or not. How important... I am having a little trouble hearing you. Sorry, Congressman. It is That's quite loud thought. here, so my apologies. How, uh, and how important is it in terms of safeguarding America's nuclear secrets? It is very important. It is of the utmost importance to protect our nation's secrets, period. And so if, as was alleged, there were documents that contain America's nuclear secrets in a storage room, uh, in a bathroom, or in a ballroom, would that concern you? It would absolutely concern me. But again, the FBI had access to those documents, they had access to those boxes, and they had access to all those rooms as well. Congresswoman, the FBI did not have access to those documents. There was a subpoena for those documents. And then the attorneys Last for Donald summer, Trump said that they had reported, given the all of the documents over, when then that was not true, and then they had to have a raid. I remember yeah. last summer. Thank you so that much, Congresswoman. Open source I apologize the FBI about the audio issues. Yeah, I'm sure. I apologize. I'm, we're having uh, an audio issue, but Congresswoman, I thank you so much for joining us. Hey, uh, 
Yep. I, 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 there was, I, we were getting some feedback, so I apologize on that, but I think there was some back and forth. There was some misunderstanding. She was misrepresenting what, in fact, the FBI had access to at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, there's, there's no way. It, she made it sound that, like, the FBI had, FBI had unfettered access to the, those documents. Well, they didn't, and, and that's why there were negotiations and ultimately the subpoena. Yeah, I was, it was a misrepresentation, to be clear, uh, of what the issue was. The president, the National Archives repeatedly asked, demanded, uh, that those presidential records, government records, be turned back over. When they were not then, they said, we're going to refer this to the Department of Justice and the FBI. The referral was then made. A subpoena was then issued. Doc, some documents were handed over. The Trump attorneys signed an affidavit that said they had turned them all over, which was inaccurate mm -hmm. and not true, mm -hmm. which is why then there was an additional seizure of additional classified documents. Also, if you're looking for a similar standard to be applied, there's a special counsel looking into the facts of the case with Joe Biden. He hasn't skated. It's happening. The difference in the two cases, the differences we know because we don't have the findings of the special counsel looking into the current president, but we know the difference is that Joe Biden acted voluntarily, whereas the former president did not act voluntarily. We also know that the number of cases is far smaller than in the case with Donald Trump. We also, nobody who talks about standards with respect to law enforcement, let's imagine for a moment that you thought Hillary Clinton was guilty. There's nobody who says that a, a miscarriage of justice in one case, if that's what you hold, gets somebody off in another. In other words, our mothers told us that two wrongs don't make a right. So you should enforce the standard in any given instance. And in this instance, the, the, the energy to, to assert a standard is missing from the conversation of the presidents, those who would defend the president. Also, there's a political standard, whether the president maintain the kind of character that you would want of a person who's asking to be given power again in the uh, presidency. <clears throat> what is at stake in terms of the FBI's credibility with this case and the continued assaults on the FBI's credibility? If you come to South Florida, which I've done numerous times because I like visiting South Florida, you talk to people down here and some of them will say the FBI has gotten beyond its charter. The FBI is under control, uh, out of control. And why do they say that? Because they see what is happening to former President Trump and they don't like it. However, if you talk to law enforcement, the FBI was simply doing its job upholding the Constitution, enforcing laws. Uh, and in this case, you know, the subpoenas, the negotiations with the Trump team, that didn't happen in a matter of weeks or days. All of this was drawn out over probably a year and a half, maybe longer. Uh, because I've talked to sources within the uh, FBI as well as within the Department of Justice who insist that they did not want to be here this day where a former president was indicted in a case like this. They tried to appeal to the former president to turn over everything that he had, and it just wasn't happening. And that's why we are where we are today. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, Donald Trump has pleaded, has pleaded not guilty to 37 federal counts in this courthouse behind us in Miami. Um, he is joined by several of his attorneys. He was at the table along with his valet, Walt Nauta, who is also charged. And across from them is the prosecutor, special counsel, Jack Smith. Want to bring in Scott Fredrickson, a former federal prosecutor. And Scott, your take on some of the arguments being made about what Donald Trump is charged with. Well, it's pretty straightforward. First, uh, to the congressman's, congresswoman's uh, points. First, Jim Comey made a specific finding: no willful uh, retention or misrepresentation by Hillary Clinton. It probably cost her the presidency, but there was no obstruction or anything alike. Uh, the irony here is that, by all reports, when Chris. Kais, who's standing next to President Trump in the courtroom, uh, first was brought in. In full disclosure, he was a partner of mine in my firm before he left to represent President Trump. By all reports, he counseled President Trump to cooperate with the DOJ to try and get these documents back. 
And the fact is, it's the same standard. If he had done that, we would not be here today. Instead, it's the criminal obstruction. It's the lying. It's the false statements. It's the hiding. It's the lying to his counsel. That's why we're here today. Scott Fredrickson, uh, thank you. And on that note, then, how limited are Trump's attorneys in terms of addressing this case? What would be their best defense? Well, the best defense here is now that you're indicted, you've got to go a thousand percent with all the motions uh, to try and knock out as much evidence as possible. Um, Jack Smith has anticipated that. The, the beauty of this talking indictment is it anticipates these arguments that somehow he had them by mistake or he didn't understand or he could declassify. The indictment rebuts that on its face. Uh, they're going to challenge use of classified documents by the government. The government uh, has to be careful about putting you know, classified documents out there and there's a complicated procedure, the SEPA, uh, which will govern that. Um, so they'll go at that. Uh, so these motions and then the first thing they'll do is they're going to make huge burdensome demands of discovery. They're going to want everything the whole U.S. government has that has anything to do with that. Um, that's going to uh, develop into a huge fight and it'll take a lot of time to work through. Um, but right now, the best defense counsel right now are going to, to do all that. They also have uh, legal arguments they're going to fashion having to do with his former status as the president. Obviously, the use of his uh, attorney uh, client uh, his attorney's statement. So it's going to be a panoply of motions, a discovery, huge demands for that. It's going to be a big fight starting with the first hearing. Scott Friedrichsen, uh, thank you. Want to talk about where the public is at this point because there is new CBS News polling that shows Republicans say they are more concerned that Trump's indictment is politically motivated than his alleged conduct being a national security risk. I want to bring in our chief correspondent, chief Washington correspondent, Major Garrett. And Major, the politics of this, uh, even as the president, former president, will face a trial jury. Right. Good afternoon, Laura. It's great to be with you. And let me set the scene. I'm not where you are in Miami. I'm where this story in a few hours is coming. Trump's golf course in Bedminster, New Jersey. And let me just set the scene for the audience. The golf course is operating full tilt. Uh, golf carts are moving and zipping around. People are playing golf, utterly indifferent, immune to the large media contingent that is right here in front of the Trump National Golf Club, what you see behind me. You see a podium and some chairs arrayed in front of that podium. Later tonight, about 8.15 Eastern, we are told former President Trump will give a speech to a gathered group of invited guests and club members, which will also double as a fundraiser. And I'll get to the politics and our graphics of our poll numbers in just a second. But that fundraiser, I'm told by those close to the campaign, they have a target amount of about $2 million raised tonight. That's not outrageously large, but the Trump campaign believes it would be consistent with sending a signal that he is undaunted amid these criminal charges. He is unbowed, unswayed, and will make a political argument about his future that as a candidate, he should not be in this position, that as the front runner for the Republican Party for the 2024 nomination, he should not be charged, whatever his underlying conduct is. That's one of the arguments, that all this is happening because he is the political front runner. And rhetorically, he wants to reinforce that here in Bedminster later on tonight. Now, back to the polling data that we have at CBS, conducted in a poll across the country, June 7th to June 10th. I want the audience to keep in mind two numbers, 61%. Let's bring up the first. Why is that 61% relevant? Well, that's how many people in our survey, likely Republican and caucus voters, say they now support Donald Trump. 61%. Ron DeSantis, close, sort of, at 23%. Everyone else announced far, far, far below. What's the other 61% I want the audience to remember? Well, let's go to the next graphic. 61% said, after hearing about the indictment, it did not change their opinion of former President Trump. Won't change, 61%. 14% said it made them feel better about former President Trump. So 75% of those likely 
Republican primary and caucus voters that we surveyed said it either made no difference or it improved their sense of feeling about former President Trump. 18% said they weren't sure. Only 7% Nora said it made them feel worse about the former president. It is a snapshot right now, a reflexive one within the Republican Party to rally around the former president. Is that durable? Will that last the whole summer? We don't know yet, but that's where things are now. That's what the atmosphere here is at Bedminster. And that's what we're expected to hear later tonight when the former president addresses a small crowd and the chairs arrayed just behind me. Major Garrett, with that new information and those new poll numbers, thank you. It is just after 3.30 p.m. in the east. And for those of you just joining us, we are here in Miami witnessing history unfold in this federal courthouse behind me. Former President Donald Trump is now officially a criminal defendant after being arraigned on charges linked to his mishandling of classified documents. Trump, through his attorney, pleaded not guilty to the 37 federal counts against, against him. It is the first time in American history that a president of the United States, former or current, has faced federal charges. CBS's Scott McFarlane was inside the courtroom, and he joins us now with new details. Scott? Nor the proceedings continue as we speak, so let me bring in our justice report, reporter and producer, Rob Legary, who, like me, learned what it's like to run in Miami Heat in mid-afternoon hours. Um, as we expected, the former president's going to be released. They will not be holding him in detention in this case. There were release conditions discussed in court, and Rob was there for that. What are the release conditions under which the former president of the United States will be held? Right. So, there's, Scott, there's no con no limitations on his travel, international, domestic. He won't surrender his passport. What was being argued about for about the last 10 minutes was between the judge and, the ju and uh, Trump's defense attorneys over a special condition that the judge wanted to impose, limiting Trump's communication with witnesses in the case. Now, Trump's attorneys recognized and and the judge did as well, as did the Justice Department, that a lot of the witnesses in the case are employees of the former president, people who work in his security detail at his resorts and golf clubs. And so the resolution that was created was the Justice Department will create a list at its discretion, submit it to Trump's attorneys, and they will agree that those witnesses on that list will not communicate with the former president about the facts of the case. They will still be able to communicate as they would in normal daily life, but they won't be able to talk about the case. The other condition is that he cannot talk to Walt Nauta, his co-defendant, about the facts of the case either because they're co-defendants. A lot going on there. Walt Nauta was traveling with the former president this weekend in campaign stops. So there's a list that will be created and likely litigated of people with whom the former president cannot speak about this case, potentially including his employees and his close allies. The release conditions you mentioned, no limitations on his international travel or his domestic travel as he runs for the White House and the nomination in 2024. But he is free to move about without any bond, without any other restrictions. There will be a personal assurity bond, and that's just a basically an unspecified dollar amount that will just be assured to make sure that any conditions of release that were just listed um, are agreed to. A personal assurity yeah. bond. You don't have to put money up right. front. Precisely. It's right. just there right. to ensure his compliance to guarantee it. So there's still more to come. The helicopters are still overhead, Nora, which means the president is still inside in courtroom 13-3 here of the Ferguson Federal Court building. And one reason he's still here, his co-defendant is next up. They now must formally arraign Walt Nada, who's sitting at the same defense table. At this moment, they appear to be halfway through. Scott McFarlane, thank you. It's a moment to take a look at exactly where we are, John, now that the president has been arraigned still inside this courthouse for more than an hour and a half. Donald Trump now faces a number of legal and uh, challenges. Yeah. Uh, in we haven't heard yet from Georgia We're talking about New no, York well, here, this federal charges and potentially in Georgia that's right he faces uh, Jack Smith is still doing work on the uh, January 6th uh, insurrection and then there's the from Georgia but what happens now is his fortunes bounce bounce through the legal system with claims and counterclaims and judges ruling all the noise that has been pelting us here today uh, is out of that process and now it's whether his arguments can win the day in court 
in terms of the, the legal battle he has before him, I think it's quite interesting that he's not allowed to talk to his co-defendant um, because, as we were talking earlier, um, you know, that's the way prosecutors work to try and create space is if you, um, if you can uh, get the individual defendants on their own. And so forgive me, I couldn't hear, but so are they saying that, that, that he is no longer allowed to talk to his valet? They want to limit the witnesses that he can talk to. From what I gathered from that reporting is that the prosecutor's prosecution is going to come up with a list. They will submit that to the court. And these are people that they do not want the former president interacting with. And, of course, the big name is Nada, the valet. If if he is uh, separated from the president, will that change the status of his cooperation? Because there is a lot of pressure on him to flip against the former president. And the pressure comes from the fact that he might serve time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because, it, because he, according to the indictment, didn't tell the truth to uh, to investigators when they interviewed him. And is Scott Friedrichson still with us? Maybe you could go over just how much time, I know I've read it, how much time Walt Nauta faces uh, if he were found guilty. Because when you're staring at a sentence, it sometimes sharpens the you. mind and the motivation. Scott? Yeah, how much Nora, time are we talking we just about? Lay out the scene. I'm sorry, Nora, could you repeat that question for me? Yes, thank you. On the question of how much time could uh, okay. the Donald thank Trump's God. valet, Walt Nada, face if convicted? I thought she said Friedrichson. I'm, I'm going to throw it on next time okay. I go on because it's we're getting that we're, we've reached that Do point. Okay, answer. got it. It's a, it's a difficult and fluid situation here outside the federal uh, courthouse. I think that in here in hot Miami, it's fried some of the audio wires. So let's bring. It. <laughs> in addition to my hair, it has fried some of the audio wires. So let's bring in Catherine Harris and Catherine. Uh, you may know some of the time uh, that that not only Donald Trump is facing, but also his ballet, Walt Nauta. Yeah, thanks, Nora. I'm going back to the uh, indictment. First, Walt Nada, uh, if he is convicted under counts 32, 33, and 34, so conspiracy to obstruct justice, withholding a document or a record, uh, that has a maximum term of 20 years in prison and a maximum fine of $250,000. Uh, there is a lesser charge of uh, lying to federal investigators. Uh, that's 18 U.S.C. 1001. Uh, every single count under lying to federal investigators can bring five years uh, in prison. So, uh, to say the least, there may be a lot of mo motivation for this aide, Walt Nada, to cooperate with investigators, but to this point, he has refused to do so. What I would also note, based on Scott McFarland's reporting from inside the courthouse, is it sounds to me, based on my two decades working these kinds of cases, that special counsel Jack Smith has additional witnesses up his sleeve. This indictment is designed to be a criminal indictment, but also to be an explanation for the public as to why he's taken this extraordinary step to indict a former president and potential nominee for his party in 2024. But no prosecutor is going to put all their cards on the table right out of the gate. So this discussion about coming up with a list of individuals who will be off limits to the former president in the future tells me that Jack Smith has additional witnesses that we are yet to become aware of. Well, Catherine, that's really interesting. Um, and that has been alluded to is that uh, this indictment by no means contains all of the evidence um, that prosecutors Correct. have acquired, that there, there could be much more. It's also, and I want to get this uh, because you cover the intelligence community, there's also, there could be um, a specific intelligence that was not included in this document because it was made public, and so they didn't want to compromise any of the intelligence or sources or methods, correct? 
Yeah, Nora, I'm glad you want to drill down into that. Um, as we've been reporting here at CBS News, there are 31 counts that relate to the willful retention of national defense information, which simply means for the layperson that you have highly classified information. At one point, you had a right to have it, and then you refused to return it to its rightful owner, the U.S. government. Under those counts, there are involved 21 top secret documents, some of them at the highest levels of the U.S. intelligence community, including what's called special access programs. These are programs that are so secret because of the technology or the sources or the methods that in some cases, the U.S. government doesn't even acknowledge their existence. There's other intelligence here called TK or talent keyhole. This is intelligence from space, from our spy satellites, that can help us understand the smallest movements of an adversary. In all of these cases, what we're talking about with a compromise is what they describe in the intelligence community, the expectation of exceptionally grave damage to national security. So that's the big picture on this case, Nora. All right, Catherine Harridge, thank you. Let's bring in Scott Friedrichsen, a former federal prosecutor. Scott, can I get you to weigh in on that same point that Catherine was talking about? Who are these additional witnesses? What could be this additional evidence? What else is out there that we may not know about? Well, I think Catherine is uh, right on point. Uh, it would be naive of us to assume that uh, what we read in the indictment is all the evidence that the special counsel has amassed. Uh, I'll give you 10 to 1 odds that there's a, uh, a significant number of witnesses and a, a large amount of evidence that uh, the special counsel has already obtained, uh, has put in the grand jury, and will be used at trial. What we saw was a very specifically tailored indictment. We can assume the 31 documents were probably reviewed and approved by the intelligence community uh, to appear in the indictment. Uh, and one of the most complicated things we're going to be facing in this case is uh, the use of classified documents, especially the kind that Catherine just described. There's a procedure for that, um, but that kind of document, that kind of information can't be made public. So those are going to be the subject of extensive hearings. Uh, for the government to determine how it can use those that information in its case. And we're going to see that in the case in addition to those 31 documents identified in the indictment. All right, Scott Friedrichsen, thank you. want to bring in Robert Costa on this same point as well. Robert, the idea that there's an addition, additional evidence and information out there would seem to make it also politically perilous for some of these Republicans who have already gone out full board to defend Donald Trump. Nora, that's right. This is a fluid moment inside the Republican presidential race. I've been texting with other uh, sources close to the rival campaigns, and they're telling me this afternoon they're all watching this very closely. Now, they're not going to come out and start speaking against former President Trump right now. They know he has a lot of support in the Republican Party, but they're starting to wonder is this a moment where he maybe doesn't break apart politically, but to, does he start to show some cracks? I sat down with the Georgia governor, Brian Kemp, a conservative who's broken with Trump in some respects, and he told me yesterday that he has concern about this indictment, about Trump's conduct. He called this entire thing a distraction for the party. He said the party can't get bogged down in what's going on here. And former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie has been speaking out sharply about Trump's conduct, and even former Vice President Mike Pence, who served with Trump, has questioned whether the former president follows the rule of law. But legally, this is going to be something that's fascinating to watch in the coming months. For Todd Blanche, the attorney who's now leading this case, this could be the case of a lifetime. He left his law firm. He has now come into this Donald Trump orbit to be the lead attorney in a federal case. Notable that he was not the one coming out to speak to reporters. He was the one speaking in court for Trump, saying Trump was certainly not guilty in his view. And based on my conversations with Trump's sources, this case, if it ends up with a conviction, will be appealed and appealed and appealed by the Trump side, perhaps all the way up to the Supreme Court, because ultimately the lawyers are going to argue Trump had the right 
executive privilege to have these documents. So this is going to be something that potentially lasts, lasts months, even a year or more. Robert Costa, thank you. John Dickerson is with us on that same point. Oh, okay. Well, holler once we learn something new, if there's new information. I'll bring in John real quick on that point. The political question is in a general election. It's not the Republican primary voter who 80% think this is politically motivated. The majority, according to CBS poll, of the larger electorate thinks there is something here if, there, if in fact, the, what the indictment says is true. And Republicans have to make a calculation with two other uh, potential legal actions in the wings, the other Jack Smith and the other Jack Smith investigation and Fulton County in Georgia. If a candidate who's carrying all of that baggage in a general election, after having lost a general election and having influenced the 22 uh, Senate elections, is going to have the staying power to survive. And I understand that Donald Trump has left the hearing. Let's uh, bring in Scott McFarland, who's just outside the courthouse with new information. Scott. Nora, this proceeding has just ended. They have completed with his co-defendant, Walter Nada. So now, the former president's leaving. Stephen Portnoy of CBS News Radio was in the courtroom and was in the overflow room and heard the second part of the proceedings with Mr. Nada. Tell us what happened. Well, the proceedings are now done for the day, Scott. They lasted about 45 minutes in total. Walt Nauta was not represented by an attorney who is here, licensed in the Southern District of Florida. So the judge actually continued that arraignment for two more weeks. So uh, that, that proceeding is now on pause. But the judge did accept the not guilty plea for Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump has now been released on his own recognizance on a personal surety bond. The only conditions that the judge set really had to do with any communications that he might have with people who could wind up being called as witnesses in this case. Uh, his defense attorneys made the point that so many of the witnesses might be people who are on the former president's uh, security details, uh, secret service agents, and, and even the president's uh, lawyer has been suggested would be a witness in this case. So the judge uh, is essentially allowing the two sides to uh, discuss this matter further, but essentially the prosecutor is going, the, the special counsel's office is going to come together with a list of people who they uh, say that the former president should not have any contact with about the case. What the judge accepted was the defense attorney's argument that there might be some interactions that the former president might have with witnesses. It's just a prohibition on conversations about the case. So Walter Nada was not formally arraigned because he didn't have a local counsel of record, which is required for arraignments in the federal system. So he comes back here in a couple weeks. He'll be, well, he doesn't necessarily have to appear. And that was something interesting. Wow. Apparently an arraignment in, in a case like this can occur without his presence as long as uh, the, the attorney follows all the rules. That was a, a key point the judge made. It's possible that Walt Nauta may come back. Uh, what was so interesting to me to watch, Scott, was how the former president sat looking sullen with his arms folded at times. Uh, he was handed the bond to sign with some of the conditions that the judge had set. Uh, he pulled the pen out of his own jacket pocket, reviewed the documents, uh, signed uh, several times on several pages that had to be witnessed by his attorney. It was a formality. But through it all, the former president appeared uh, to have a frown on his face. He did not look like he was having a particularly good time. Uh, the proceedings lasted about 45 minutes and when it was over, uh, the uh, judge said, the good news is my uh, uh, involvement in this case ends right now, and that provoked a smile. I'll note that if Walt Trinata doesn't have to appear for an arraignment, there's also no next scheduled appearance in court for the former president. There was no reference in the proceeding today about a future appearance or hearing in this matter involving the former president. So it, there are undoubtedly will be one, but we don't know of one at this moment. One thing that struck me as somebody who sat in Manhattan through the initial appearance for the former president in that prosecution and somebody who sat through this arraignment today, Trump's expression was the same. Expressionless, hunched over, saying nothing, writing nothing, making no use of the papers in front of him. But the judges had a different tenor to them. The judge in Manhattan referred to Donald Trump as Mr. Trump. This judge, Jonathan Goodman, referred to him multiple times as former President Trump, a little more reverential. Uh, what else can you, did you notice about either Trump's demeanor or what was said in court? Well, I think it was also interesting. He didn't actually say what his plea was. His attorney, Todd Blanche, entered it on the former president's behalf. It was he didn't speak at all. He didn't speak at all uh, and sat there, as I say, rather, rather sullen, uh, with a frown on his face, arms folded, hunched over a bit. Uh, he looked directly at the judge throughout. 
And uh, it was only that one moment at the end when the judge suggested that his, his work here is done because the case will be handed off to District Court Judge Eileen Cannon. Uh, Trump smiled when, he, when it was uh, clear that the, the, the magistrate judge's uh, involvement was, was complete. It sounds as if there's been no determination of where the next hearing will be either. This case is earmarked for West Palm Beach, Florida. This obviously happens in Miami. It's quite possible the next set of hearings happen in Miami where they certainly have the size in the courthouse and the security footprint to handle everything. Everything that is here today, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of Trump supporters on the plaza. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of members of the media. I want to bring in Graham Cates, and we're going to do a little um, maneuvering to get him in here. Graham Cates was actually in the courtroom itself for this roughly 45 minute proceeding, this arraignment of former President Trump and this initial appearance of his co defendant, Waltrin Nada. Graham Cates running through the Miami street to get here. What did you see or hear in the courtroom that struck you? You know, there was a little bit difference of a vibe. The, the judge referred to him as former President Trump repeatedly in his Manhattan indictment. The judge was calling him Mr. Trump. There was these kind of little differences. And then he was ordered to uh, sign a personal surety bond that said he you know, wouldn't commit another crime. Uh, and that um, he's being told not to communicate with any potential witnesses that will be listed by the prosecution I, I, one, about one the case itself, about the uh, facts of the case. One thing that was mentioned earlier, I want to reaffirm because I, I had left the courtroom by this point. He can travel domestically, internationally, as he runs for the White House. Yeah, and the judge asked the special counsel about that. Do you have any issues with him traveling? And they said, no, we, we don't want to impose any restrictions on him for that. And they actually didn't really ask for any restrictions. It was the judge's idea to impose this one extra restriction, which is that even though so many of the potential witnesses are employees of former President Trump or involved in his everyday life, that he may not discuss with them any of the facts of the case. And they're going to get this limited list of people uh, who, who from, from here on out, he can see, he can talk to, but just not about the case. All right, Nora, a 45-minute proceeding that's wrapped mm -hmm. up, but not right. completed. Well, Trinata has to come back for arraignment or have his arraignment soon. Scott McFarlane and Graham Cates with all that inside information and color from inside the courthouse want to bring in our senior White House and political correspondent Ed O'Keefe. And Ed, so fascinating what we have learned today. I should note we are also going to watch at the same time. You can hear the motorcycles as uh, Donald Trump's motorcade is about to depart here. And those are the helicopters. Those are media helicopters. But it is really interesting. I know you've been watching very closely what these Republicans who are running for president in 2024 are saying about the indictment. That's right, Nora. Earlier today, for example, the former South Carolina governor, Nikki Haley, was asked whether she would consider pardoning former President Trump were he to be convicted and she said she's inclined in favor of a pardon which is notable because she was one of the most critical of the details of this indictment just yesterday uh, in a separate interview a sort of an example of how some of these Republicans now are trying to straddle uh, the anger that so many Republican base voters have with the process as we heard from Congresswoman Nancy Mace a little earlier uh, but also now the seriousness of the substance inside this indictment uh, one of his uh, potential opponents Vivek Ramaswamy is there in Miami and was saying he would pardon the former president, were he to somehow be elected president. Others, though, have, have been pretty much off the grid this week, raising money and otherwise not saying much at all. At the White House, we should note, his potential general election opponent, President Biden, has said nothing. They continue to refuse comment on whether the president's read the indictment, what he thinks of it, instead keeping to an official schedule today that included meeting with the Secretary General NATO and the and president of Uruguay. Nora? And you can hear the loud cheers of the crowd as Donald Trump's motorcade is just turning the corner very close to where we are as he exits this federal courthouse. He's been here for about two hours after pleading not guilty, sitting side by side by his valet, Walt Nauta, who also faces charges in this indictment. supportive crowd gathered here in Miami. A 
unusual, actually, that a group of people could get so close to the motorcade. That's not something we usually see with either a uh, presidential motorcade. Um, I, I think that's why federal officials were concerned about some of the security. You didn't have enough barricades up. And so you're right nowhere to see people running alongside those vehicles is a little disconcerting. Mm -hmm. um, and he is now publicly expected to head back to um, the airport and he will return to Bedminster, New Jersey, where he has another golf club there. He stayed at his, his golf club in Doral last night. Then he'll go back to Bedminster where, he, um, as Major Garrett was telling us, he will meet with supporters and have a fundraiser tonight. I want to go around um, as and get everyone's final thoughts on this. Uh, Robert Costa, you are down there in the thick of it, but this has been a monumental day. Robert? It really has, Nora. Nora, when you look at today, we, we've talked a lot about politics. We've talked a lot about the law, but I'm also thinking about American democracy. 50 years ago this summer, the Watergate hearings with President Richard Nixon transfixed this country. It was about whether the rule of law would persevere, whether the nation could remain calm. It was a turbulent time then. As you just saw from the scenes outside this courthouse in Miami, there's turbulence again in the United States in the middle of a presidential campaign. But at the core of it is a question. Will the American democratic system, the rule of law persist? in a civil way, in a way where it's peaceful, whether it's the transfer of power in 1974 or whether it's the indictment and charges against a former president, a reckoning for America, especially its democracy today. A reckoning for America where the justice system is at the center of trying to hold Donald Trump accountable. At the same time, differing views about whether protecting America's secrets, America's military, and America's intelligence operations is worth it. Well, it's the views are actually the same. It's just when you choose to express them. The people who are defending the current president previously stated very firm views about what your obligations were to handle material like this. The chants you just heard could easily have included lock her up, which used to be the signature chant of the Trump campaign rallies, which was supposed to be the criminal charges resulting from mishandling of documents, which were less grave than what's alleged in this indictment. So the standards just aren't being applied. But the reckoning that Bob talks about has two channels. One is the legal. There are rules and norms for that. The other is political. And, and the rules of that are all very much up in the air. And whether that reckoning and turmoil is increased or decreased is in the hands of those in public life who have a duty to uh, turn the temperature down instead of turning it up. Democracy is an imperfect system, and it is messy at times. But that is the system that we have chosen it is. here in America. Yes. We can keep, we can make it less messy, though. We don't have to make it messier. That's right. But included in that is a free press and free speech. So thank you, <laughs> Jeff Begays, John Dickerson, Robert Costa, to all of our correspondents and guests, and everyone involved in today's special coverage. And uh, just a reminder of today's historic event, something that has never pl taken place in American history until now, former President Donald Trump, now a criminal defendant in the federal court system, arraigned on 37 counts, including the willful retention of classified documents and conspiracy to obstruct. Investigators say the documents included some of the highest levels of classification that protect our nation's secrets. Our coverage will continue on CBS News streaming your local news and then tonight on the CBS Evening News. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell.